My colleague who is joining me also now live from Capitol Hill. Um, Aleem, where are you? What are you seeing? Well, we're just uh, outside uh, the Capitol building, as you can see, and just in the last few minutes, after a lull of an hour or so, we heard sound bombs, uh, we saw tear gas being, uh, uh, being deployed, and that was just to clear, you might be able to make out the top level of uh, all of this, uh, this stage and this scaffolding that was all set up for the inauguration uh, in two weeks' time. Uh, Trump uh, supporters took over all of that area, and there are still hundreds all around uh, the building. They're right up the steps at the back of the building, right to the door of the Capitol building, which, of course, is, has been shut now. Uh, but no sense that people are going to suddenly leave in, in less than an hour when that curfew uh, comes into force. Uh, and what have they been saying to you, the protesters, that they want? What are they making? Do they feel this has been a victorious moment for them? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're sort of uh, quite giddy uh, when we, we talk to them. Uh, I've spoken to some of the very people who actually managed to enter into the building, and, and the sense I was trying to get it was uh, as to whether this was something that was planned. And I've, I've spoken to several people now, and none of them uh, said it was part of the plan of the day to actually get inside the building. They certainly said, all of them, that they felt inspired by the words of Donald Trump uh, to, to march to the Capitol. Uh, to take back their country. For them, they interpreted that as, uh, as needing to really make their presence felt. But they all said that once they got here, that they felt that they could easily overwhelm uh, security, get past security. Uh, we saw some confrontation, but they all talk about security essentially stepping back. And that's why some of them found themselves in the building. One of them described uh, the fact that he then started just to, to knock on doors inside the Capitol building and then found himself uh, just outside the chair chamber, but left when uh, security was beefed up inside. We saw another woman who uh, had uh, injured her leg through crawling out of a window uh, to, to get back out of, of the Capitol building. Uh, but still uh, extraordinary scenes here as, uh, as hundreds are still all over the Capitol grounds. OK, Aline McBull there outside um, the U.S. Capitol building. Thank you very much. And I did speak earlier to a member of Congress who was in the uh, chamber when the Capitol Police told them to effectively hide under their desks or under their chairs or get down low because they were worried about the security of those members of, of Congress. Earlier, President Trump posted a video message on Twitter. Here it is. I know you're pain. I know you're hurt. We had an election that was stolen from us. It was a landslide election, and everyone knows it, especially the other side. But you have to go home now. We have to have peace. We have to have law and order. We have to respect our great people in law and order. We don't want anybody hurt. It's a very tough period of time. There's never been a time like this where such a thing happened, where they could take it away from all of us, from me, from you, from our country. This was a fraudulent election, but we can't play into the hands of these people. We have to have peace. So go home. We love you. You're very special. You've seen what happens. You see the way others are treated that are so bad and so evil. I know how you feel, but go home and go home in peace. Uh, President Trump there telling his supporters, we love you, you're very special. Our North America editor, John Sopel, has been watching the day's events uh, unfold. He joins me now. John, I want to get your reaction as our, our North America editor, somebody who's been covering this administration for the last four years, to what happened today on Capitol Hill. Well, I think the clip you played there is the central contradiction of the Trump presidency. And just imagine that it was Black Lives Matter protesters who had stormed the Capitol, broken windows, gone in there armed, would he be saying, we love you, you're very special people? I don't think so. The other contradiction in all of this is that Donald Trump rules for his, his side of the aisle. He, he, he's got his base and he never says anything to upset the base. And so how can you argue that you are the party of law and order and you believe in laws, you're a nation of laws, when the place you litigate this is in the courts, which the Trump campaign have done entirely within their rights, 62 occasions, lost 61 cases. 
No one has found fraud. The Attorney General didn't find fraud. The person in charge of election security didn't find, find fraud. The head of the FBI didn't find fraud. Mitch McConnell, the Senate Majority Leader, said today there was no fraud. So how can you say go home and accept this at the same time as you're saying it was a fraud and on the basis of no evidence? And that, I think, is why you have got this discord in the United States, which is frightening. I think America is on edge tonight and the, the shining city on the hill, the light is flickering dangerously. Uh, and John, what, to pick up on that, what you're inferring there is, what do America's allies make of this? What does London make of this? Do they put this down to the last gasps of the Trump administration and the chaos of the last four years? Or does it raise more serious questions about the solidity of America's democratic institutions and concerns amongst America's allies? I think it shows that democratic institutions cannot be taken for granted that although that the US Constitution has shown itself to be a pretty resolute document over the past four years, the seams are being torn at tonight. And there is a fragility uh, to US democracy. Uh, you ask what they're thinking in London. And the last time, as I understand it, that the Capitol building was stormed was in 1814 by the British when Britain was trying to take back control of the United States of America and the fledgling republic. And of course they designed a constitution, the founding fathers, that would be robust and wouldn't let power amass to one person too much. There will be some people who will argue tonight that too much power has been amassed by Donald Trump, that those who should have known better to try to keep him in check didn't do that job. And so late in the day Mitch McConnell, the vice president, some others, are saying for the first time, whoa, 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 stop. And maybe there will be those who argue that maybe that should have been said a little bit earlier. OK, uh, John Sopel there joining us from uh, the streets of very tense Washington, D.C. tonight. Thank you very much. And, of course, there is a curfew now going into practice here in D.C. to try and disperse those uh, demonstrators outside Capitol Hill, but no indication that they have uh, any plans to leave that building yet. Joining me now is Democratic strategist... Amanda Renteria and, a f and former advisor to President George W. Bush, Ron Christie. Um, uh, Ron, let me start with you uh, and get your reaction to what has happened today, uh, particularly in the light of what President Trump said to the protesters outside the White House to telling them to march on the Capitol, saying perhaps he would join them there and saying that he would never concede. That's a sad day for democracy. Uh, the notion that you have the President of the United States speaking out to his supporters, not conceding, not recognizing what has happened with a peaceful transfer of power through the ballot box and what we're seeing unfolding now on Capitol Hill is utterly disgraceful. The notion that he has not taken to the airwaves, that he has not asked his supporters who are marching in his name to stand down, to stop assaulting police officers, to stop really running ransack over the Capitol, really demonstrates, as John Sokol said a few moments ago, a scene that we haven't seen here in Washington since the Battle of Bladensburg in 1814, where we had mayhem in the Capitol. This needs to stop and stop immediately. Amanda, it doesn't look like it's going to stop tonight. What happens now on Capitol Hill to members of Congress? Do they come back and carry on their debate about uh, the certification of Joe Biden's um, election? Or, or have we moved beyond that? They must come back and finish this. That's the key message here. That's what they're beginning to come together to say. But everybody recognizes anarchy cannot win. The Capitol is the place where people come together and make things happen when the moment is supposed to, when the moment comes to these leaders. And right now, as they're all in the basement, um, I've been there in the Capitol when you have protests or when you have marches or when people get nervous and worried. It is a real test right now of leaders coming together to say, we are not going to be held back. Progress is going to continue. And that's really the charge right now for many of those members of Congress who are trying to move forward. You cannot stop and allow this to hold anything back. America's watching. The world is watching. Um, and we will see that unfold. I suspect, and conversations are happening, how do they carry on the business of what they were already doing and not be held back by this moment? Because that's a message into itself about peaceful transfer of power. 
Amanda, do you think there is a chance that this does bring Democrats and Republicans together on Capitol Hill and that perhaps those who are on the fringes uh, of American politics have actually overplayed their hands today? I do. And you saw that early on with McConnell coming out. You really did see the split in the Republican Party. Um, and then this happens right after, which will solidify. Um, I, I think there's nothing quite like uh, being locked in a basement, calling your loved ones and saying, I'm OK, I'm safe. This brings it to a whole new level. And you already started to see both Chuck and McConnell um, start to work together in, those early, in that early statement this morning. Um, I think that's the momentum to build off of. But you simply, if you're sitting in the Capitol and you understand the, the real beauty and power of this institution, you have to look at yourself in the mirror and say, is this worth it? And how do we bring it together again? And I think there's nothing like having to call your family from a basement to say you're OK. Mm -hmm. Ron, power has shifted in America in the last 48 hours. Is the Republican Party still the party of Donald Trump? I wish I could answer that question, Caddy. Uh, I, I think this is going to have far-ranging ramifications about what many conservatives, what many Republicans think about the 45th president of the United States. I have been a staunch Republican. I've been a staunch conservative. But I have to say to you, for having worked in Capitol Hill for eight years and worked in the White House for four, I've never seen anything like this. And the notion that the president of the United States would not speak out forcefully to denounce this has me questioning whether Republicans are loyal to a man or whether they are loyal to a country. And this mm. conservative is loyal to his country and his constitution. Mm. I think a lot of Republicans are going to scratch their heads and think about this in the days to come. Ron Christie, Amanda Renteria, thank you very much for joining me on this very dramatic day here in American politics. You can find all of the day's news, of course, it's on our website. Um, and do keep following us on Twitter as well. We will have full coverage of the events in Washington. Thanks for watching.